With that, it's 11 a.m. Uh, here in Toronto and 6 p.m. in Israel, where we welcome Daniel Schwartz, Dr. Daniel Schwartz. I first want to thank Marty Lakshin, who is online, Dr. Marty Lakshin, who made um, our shidduch and uh, um, invited and asked me to invite him. So I want, want to thank you, Marty. We look forward to learning with you again uh, in January. And uh, the learning today is being sponsored by Steve and Karen Gellis in memory of, of Steve's mother, whose third yard site is Boba Yom, is today. Begi Mindel Bat Eliyahu. Neshama should have an Aliyah. Uh, thank you to the Gellis family. Uh, just before I forget, Tonight's Parsha Shear, which I happen to be giving, we will do it on, I'll, I'll send out the links, but just to, as a forewarn you, it'll go on our regular Zoom link. In other words, the five, seven, eight, one, not the Hanukkah one. I'll send out a link to everybody to remember it. I just did want to mention that. That's at 8.30 this evening. Anyways, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Schwartz, Professor Daniel Schwartz, who is the Herbs Family Professor of Judaic Studies at the Hebrew University. As you heard us talking, he was born in Syracuse, made Aliyah as a teenager still, I believe, and he's been living in Israel for a long time, Bar Hashem, and he's been teaching at Hebrew University for many, many years. Um, this is an uh, academic of, you know, place for many years, and he is the head of the, uh, um, the academic unit of the Mandel School of Advanced Studies in, in Humanities. He uh, has taught in the Department of, of Jewish History for all these years, and he is an expert in Second Temple Greco-Roman period of Jewish history, and uh, of course an appropriate topic on Hanukkah, but we decided we'll ask him add a modern twist to it on Hanukkah in relation to what's he called Hershey and Orthodoxy, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to, to Torah Motion, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to share the screen now if I can. Let's see if this works. You see my PowerPoint now? Can you, somebody tell me, do you see it? Yes, 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 we see it all fine. I had uh, muted myself yeah. already, yes, now yes. It's the okay, fine. Um, let me just see if you can see me, that I can tell here. You see me okay? Looking for myself on this, there I am, okay. So, thank you very much Rabbi Kelman for this invitation and uh, thank you Marty, I take it you're out there, uh, who did the shidduch as the rabbi put it. I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about something which is in between ancient history and modern history, and particularly modern Judaism. Uh, I usually spend my time studying antiquity and particularly the books of Maccabees. So it really is high season for me now. Uh, but when you're studying antiquity, frequently you also study what modern or nearly modern scholars write about antiquity. And those are topics that have their own life and their own meaning as well. So what I want to talk about today is the intersection of Antiochus's decrees against Judaism, which you all know about from the Hanukkah story, Hirschian orthodoxy, that is orthodoxy a la Samson Raphael Hirsch, which also I'm sure you all know about, and German Jewry in 1938, when one of the main scholars I'll be talking about wrote what he wrote. So here you have something on this first slide, Antiochus on the left, Hirsch on the right, and in the middle, a page at random from Der Stürmer, the Nazi newspaper, on the front cover of which, of every issue, you had the, the Nazi slogan that the Juden sind unser Unglück, the Jews are our catastrophe, our misfortune. And um, I'm going to be talking about the intersection of these three. The, the question of ancient history that I want to address is, are two episodes that we know from the 170s and the 160s BCE, two episodes or two parts of one episode? Is it part one and part two of the same thing or are they two very different things? Uh, these two things we normally recall one way or the other in connection with Hanukkah and historians have given a good bit of attention to what the relationship between them was. The first episode, we know about it mainly from 175 BCE, but because it's a kind of nebulous phenomenon, it has earliest root, earlier roots as well, namely Hellenization, the process by which Jews become culturally like Greeks. 
Uh, we have various pieces of evidence about this from much earlier, but in 175, we hear about official governmental support on the part of the Syrian Seleucid regime in Judea. We hear about them being commissioned to high priests in Jerusalem who are Hellenized. They're already tending towards Greek culture. They have names that represent that, like Jason and Menelaus and Alchemus and Lysimachos. And they are given permission to found a gymnasium, which is a school which imparts Greek education of all sorts, including sports. <coughs> we hear about the school, we hear about a department of the school for older um, teenagers. We hear about these people abstaining from circumcision. We hear in a general way about their adopting Greek ways, Hellenica. And um, there's nothing coercive about any of that. We're not talking about decrees, we're talking about Jews who are interested in doing this, getting permission from the king to do it, and they do it. On the other hand, beginning in 169 or 168 BCE, we hear of governmental violence against Jerusalem, against the Jews. It begins with a robbing of the temple by Antiochus IV in probably 169 BCE. And not long thereafter, we hear of Antiochus's decrees, uh, which come with some detail, particularly in the first chapter of 1 Maccabees and in the sixth chapter of 2 Maccabees. We hear of Jews who are being coerced to eat forbidden foods and being killed if they refuse. We hear of Jews being coerced to participate in idolatrous sacrificial cult and being killed if they refuse. And here we have the famous stories of martyrs. We hear of a prohibition of Sabbath observance and Jews being killed if they were caught doing it, burning of Torah scrolls, a prohibition of circumcision and, and execution of people who have done it. And these are accompanied by various cases of martyrdom, including the uh, earliest versions of the stories that the rabbinic liter literature later tells of the mother with seven children, Chana and seven children, or the old man Elazar, these stories already appear in 2 Maccabees chapters 6 and 7 at great length, uh, stories telling about the heroic defiance of these decrees by various uh, Jews in Jerusalem, both men and women. And the question is, what's the relationship between this cultural movement among the Jews beginning around 175 in a big institutionalized way and governmental violence and coercion against the Jews in the 160s. Is it one story which begins one way and keeps on going the other way or are they two wholly different episodes? That's the ancient story. Which can be translated then into the question who brought on Antiochus's decrees? Because one hypothesis potentially is, well, the people who are bringing on Greek culture also are bringing on Antiochus's decrees, but maybe not, maybe these are two separate events. <clears throat> In 1938, as you see over here on the side, in the Central Journal of German Jewish Studies, which was being published by the Rabbinical Seminary in Breslau. And the editor of the journal was also the most senior professor at the time in the Rabbinical Seminary in Breslau, Isaac Heinemann. And he's the person I'll be focusing on. In the 1938, the spring of 1938, he published an article called Wer veranlaste den Gaubenzwang der Maccabeerzeit, who brought on the religious coercion in the Maccabean period. And I will underline that the word brought on is kind of a wishy-washy formulation. It's not exactly caused, maybe it's a little bit more than catalyzed, gave the, in German literally it means who gave the occasion for, what occasion? And Heinemann I think was being deliberate in abstaining from a clear statement about who caused it because he wanted to address more generally the thesis that, well, even if these people did not actually cause it, maybe they somehow brought it on. Okay. 
<clears throat> and he opens his article, as you see here, with what I've translated as the persecution of religion by Antiochus of Ephesus poses a special problem for scholarship. The attempt to force the Jews not only to violate a few religious laws, but also to give up their religion as such, the whole kit and caboodle, is unique in antiquity and seems to be incompatible with the tolerance of pagan religions. Namely, pagans who believe in polytheism should not have very much of a reason to be intolerant towards any particular cult because there's one cult, there's another cult, there's another cult. What's the big deal? Monotheism has its problems with a plurality of religions and we can understand why Christians might feel called upon to impose their religion upon others or Muslims or Jews, but why should a pagan do such a thing? He says, this is the problem he wants to address. Why did he do it? But he wrote his article as a response to a book. His article is basically an extended book review. The year before, Elias Bickerman had published this book called the Gotha Maccabera, the God of the Maccabees, studies of or in the meaning and origin of the Maccabean revolt. Published by Schocken, a Jewish publisher in Berlin in 1937. And these are important facts. People were writing books about ancient persecution of the Jews and publishing them in Berlin in 1937 or articles about them in Breslau in 1938. And Bickerman suggested what he suggested. We'll see that in a moment. And Heinemann wrote his response, uh, his article in response to this book by Bickerman. Now Bickerman is a very well-known figure in modern scholarship. He was born in Kishinev in 1897. He did his studies in Berlin in the 1920s and the very early 30s, which was then the main center in the world for the study of antiquity. And then he managed to move from Germany to France. And then he finally got out of Paris in just about the very last moment and made his way to the United States where he became a professor at Columbia University. And he remained there until his death basically, although as it happened, he died in Jerusalem on a visit in 1981 and is buried in Jerusalem. But his life was actually uh, for all those decades since World War II in New York where he was a professor um, in, um, at Columbia. He wrote many books, very well-known scholar. And as I gave the examples of his books here. This, the book I referred to a moment ago in 1937, a book about the institutions of the Seleucid kingdom, which is basically built, built on inscriptions and literature and papyri. This is a central work of the study of antiquity until today. Four strange books of the Bible is when he was writing about some ancient books like Daniel and Esther and what shall we think about them? He wrote so many articles that they were collected in three volumes already in 1976 and following of collected studies. Then he has a book on chronology of the ancient world which was translated into half a million languages. After he died, his student Albert Baumgarten who was a professor at Bar Ilan and lives in Jerusalem published from his notes a book on the Greek, the Jews in the Greek age, which was a much more general and synthetic volume about the meeting of Judaism and Hellenism in antiquity. And then several years later, again, his articles were published in two big fat volumes instead of those three volumes of the 70s with additional material, including an English translation of his book on the Maccabees. So now you have it all together in two very convenient volumes, although they're very bulky. He's a very well-known scholar, as I said. Here, for example, Baumgarten wrote a book about his teacher based on a lot of archival research and other research, and people write endlessly about Bickerman, as opposed to Heinemann, who is much less well-known. Not many people have heard of Isaac Heinemann, and his work is not all that popular among scholars today. But in his day, he was an important person. As I told you, he was the senior professor at the Breslau Rabbinical Seminary. He was the editor of the Central Organ of Jewish Studies in, in Germany. Germany was then the center of Jewish studies in the world. And so Heinemann was an important person in his time. <clears throat> and here you have an article on him, 
which I took out of the International Biographical Dictionary of Central European Emigres, there is such a thing. And the article on Heinemann gives some biographical data here, including the name of his father, Dr. Heinrich Heinemann, who was a Jewish scholar and was Orthodox. And it says here that Heinemann, who was born in 1876, got his doctorate at the University of Berlin in classical philology. And he attended the Berlin Rabbinical Seminary, which is the Hildesheimer Seminary, which was a very orthodox rabbinical seminary. And then it says that from 1918 to 1938, he was the lecturer in ancient and medieval Jewish literature and philosophy at the Theological Seminary in, in Breslau, later becoming its director. And concurrently, he was the editor of the journal, as I said. And in 1939, he moved to Jerusalem. And here I pose as a little question raised by this article. Well, if he finished his doctorate in 1897 and he was a lecturer in Breslau from 1918, what was he doing in all those years in between? Is it really the case that only from the age of 42 he has a job worth talking about? Well, we'll get back to that eventually. Heinemann wrote <clears throat> several books as well. This Doctoral dissertation was in Latin, as was usual practice for doctorates in classical studies. So already here you can see we've got a guy who's writing a doctoral dissertation in Latin about Solon, who was an ancient Greek philosopher. At the same time, he's going to the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary, which is a very orthodox seminary in Berlin. This is an interesting guy. And then a couple of decades later, he published two big volumes on the metaphysical writings of a Hellenistic philosopher of the second century BCE named Posidonios. He was the translator and the editor of five of the volumes in the series of German translations of the works of Philo of Alexandria. Philo was a Jewish philosopher and biblical interpreter who wrote in Greek and Heinemann was responsible for the production of five of the volumes of the translations of Philo's work. And you might already start thinking, well, Philo was probably something like Heinemann. He was a guy who was writing Greek philosophy about Jewish topics. And Heinemann, we've seen him writing a doctoral dissertation about a Greek philosophical topic. At the same time, he's going to a rabbin Jewish rabbinical seminary. 1932, Heinemann writes a a more synthetic work about Philo, namely the book is about Philo's Greek and Jewish culture or Greek and Jewish education. Kultur vergleichende Untersuchungen, the cultural studies of cultural comparison on Philo's representation of the Jewish law. And he's trying to decide in this book to what extent shall we understand Philo as a Jewish scholar or as a Hellenistic scholar or something in between. He's the editor of the journal I've mentioned a few times. After he moves to Israel, he eventually publishes a book in Hebrew, Darche Agada, which is a synthetic work about how the Midrash does its business. And after he died, there was published posthumously the work he had been working on for a very long time on Ta'ameh HaMitzvot. How does Hebrew literature in various generations deal with the question of the um, reasons for the mitzvot. So he's a productive scholar. Today he's much less known than Bickerman. And I'm going to hopefully illuminate you some about Heinemann in the course of this lecture. Let's go back to antiquity for a moment to the question I posed, question Heinemann posed. Antiochus's decrees against Judaism are really a puzzle. They're a cross deviation, first of all, from what's expected from rulers, as also from what's expected from polytheists, as Heinemann pointed out. Why they shouldn't be expected from polytheists, I already said, because polytheists are supposed to be very tolerant. You do your thing, I do my thing. Nobody claimed that any religion uh, is universal. It's also a cross deviation from what's expected from rulers, because rulers are not supposed to provoke their subjects. If Antiochus is living in Antioch in Syria and he wants to get taxes from Jerusalem and he wants not to have to worry about any military threats from Jerusalem, why should he 
upset the Jews by issuing decrees against their religion. But he did. So that's a problem. And if we ask the question, why do we do it? We get various answers in various places. Jewish tradition, as represented by Aaronisim, says, well, that's easy. Greeks are wicked. Machut Yavan Harsha'a which basically means wicked people do wicked things and don't ask for other answers. It's sort of a convenient answer for Jews to give because it means that, well, if somebody did something that hurts us, it must be totally unjustified. Nobody could possibly have a justified reason to do something like that. Avigdor Cherikova was an historian here at the Hebrew University and in 1954, he wrote an article, which eventually turned into a chapter of his book, which says, no, no, Antiochus had a good reason from his point of view to do what he did, because you should not think as Jews have always thought, and probably all of us grew up learning, you should not think that the Jews rebelled against Antiochus because he made decrees against Judaism, which is the way we all grew up. The evil Antiochus made decrees against Judaism and therefore Jews rebelled because he had no reason to do that. Rather, Cherry Kova said, it must have been the case that the Jews rebelled first and Antiochus in trying to put down their rebellion did what he did to suppress Jewish religion as well because when you're trying to put down a rebellion, you shoot at everything that moves on the other side and he pointed to Hadrian in the days of Bar Kokhba for the same way. When the Jews revolted in the days of Bar Kokhba, Hadrian came up with decrees against the practice of Judaism as well. When you're trying to suppress a subject people, you hit them wherever it hurts them. That was Cherikover's article, which he published first in Hebrew in 1954. And I'll skip a minute to the next slide. <clears throat> Here you have the tables of contents of two editions of Cherry Cover's book. In the 1931 first edition, after you have the chapter on Helena's Hellenizers in Jerusalem, there's a chapter called uh, Hatnu'a Halu'umit, the national movement. Hatnu'a Halu'umit, that sounds like the 1930s. That's what Jews in Palestine had under the mandate. They had a national movement. When the second edition of his book finally comes out, it came out posthumously because he died in 1958, but already an English version of this came out in 1959, Hellenistic Civilization and the Jews. After the chapter <clears throat> on the Hellenistic reform, he's got a chapter called Antiochus Epiphanes and his decrees. And that's the chapter which originally appeared as an article in 1954. And the next chapter is called Milchemet Hashichrur, the War of Independence. Now, when you write in 1954 or any time since then, including today in Hebrew, Milchemet Hashichrur, what you're thinking about is the War of Israeli Independence in 1948. That's the term. And Sherikova then was writing about Antiochus in antiquity in Jerusalem in 1954, having just gone through the Israeli War of Independence, which was a war to attempt to establish a Jewish national state. And when considering what must have happened in antiquity, he suggested that the same thing happened then. And as a matter of fact, you can point to some evidence why the Jews had some reason to think that Antiochus would be defeatable in 169, 168 BCE. The Romans completely humiliated Antiochus in 168 BCE. And if the Jews are rebelling shortly thereafter, Cherikova says, probably they understood that um, they had a chance of being successful. Among other theories to which Cherikova responded in his article, which eventually became part of the book. The main one was Bickerman's theory, because Bickerman had written a whole book about this just before the war, and now things are picking up after the war, and Cherry Cover is responding to him. <clears throat> Bickerman's thesis was that Hellenistic Jews enlisted royal power to push their fellow Jews into the modern era. In other words, if I revert to where we were up here, 
and ask about the relationship of the Hellenistic reformers of the 170s to the persecutors of the 160s, Bickerman's thesis was that it's really all one episode. Jews who are interested in fostering Hellenistic culture among the Jews first start doing it themselves with royal support. They, <coughs> they hope that their fellow Jews in Jerusalem are going to join in and do it with them as well. When it doesn't happen all that fast, and in fact, they run into conservative opposition in Jerusalem, Jews who are not willing to uh, give up the religion or the practices of their fathers and to start doing things Greek ways. Then according to Bickerman, these Hellenizers went to the king and explained to him that with a little bit of support of the royal power, we should be able to push the Jews into the modern era and everybody will come along. That was Bickerman's theory. <clears throat> and when you wonder what gave Bickerman that idea, well, actually what Bickerman says in the book is he compares these Jews in ancient Jerusalem to liberal Jews in Germany in the 19th and 20th century. He does that explicitly, but it's kind of hard for him to point to examples of them trying to push the government into exerting pressure upon the Jews to do the same thing. He can point to Jewish liberals, the Jewish, let's say, Hellenizers in 19th century Germany, but it's harder for them to point to them getting the government to push Jews to do the same thing. But there were such cases in Russia and Bickerman came from Russia. And I mentioned before Professor Baumgarten who wrote about Bickerman, he documents to an impressive extent just how important that Russian background was for giving Bickerman a model that he could imagine was usable in explaining what happened in the second century BCE. Heinemann's response, which I began on, on which we will focus in 1938, was therefore a response to Bickerman. And he said, no, no, no. It's not the Jews who pushed the king to do what he did. It was, in fact, the king. The king had to do it, wanted to do it by himself, and don't think the Jews convinced him to do it. That is the thrust of Heinemann's article. And as I say here, when we wonder what made Heinemann think that was the case, what led him to think that was the case, what uh, in his context made it likely for him to think of that, just like in Cherikover's context, it was likely to think of a Jewish national revolt. And in Bickerman's context, it was likely to think of reformers who were pushing the government to act. That has not yet been studied until this very moment. Uh, or the article which I listed on the first slide where I wrote about this topic. <clears throat> this is the opening of Bickerman's book. Bickerman's book. The aim of this book is a purely historical one. The task is, this is my translation, yes. The task is to determine the sequence of events we usually call the persecution of Antiochus. Yeah, he's already indicating that's not really the best name. We want to determine the sequence of events we usually call the persecution of Antiochus and to make this series of events comprehensible. And his thesis is the religious persecution was neither an accident nor did it arise out of the spirit of paganism. It originated among the Jews themselves or to be more exact from a party among the Jews who aimed at a reform of the ancestral faith. That reform was to lead to the rejection of the belief in the uniqueness of God and it goes on and gives the rest of the thesis. That's in the introduction of the book and the book is dedicated to making that claim. And along comes Heinemann in his response and he has three main responses in rejecting Bickerman's thesis. His first claim is a positive one. Antiochus had a reason of his own to impose decrees against the practice of Judaism. Antiochus wanted to unify his kingdom. The second one is a negative one. Namely, the people to whom Bickerman ascribed the initiative would not have taken such an initiative. According to Heinemann, even Hellenistic Jews would not attempt to coerce other Jews to violate Jewish religious laws. Religionsgesetze if you don't know the word gazettes, 
remember it now, Gazette's law, and it's going to be important as these things go on. And Heinemann was insistent that Hel even Hellenistic Jews, who themselves are not observing Jewish law, would not attempt to coerce other Jews to violate Jewish religious laws. At most, he says, they might encroach upon popular Jewish practices, folks zitta, the zitta of the folk. You might say customs or folk practices that were not anchored in Jewish law. Heinemann's making a serious distinction here between the things Jews do because they're Jewish and they're mandated by Jewish law and the things Jews do because they're Jewish and they're not mandated by Jewish law. Think if you like about Jewish clothing, Jewish food, speaking Yiddish, as opposed to Jewish law, okay? But Heinemann's third response comes back in the other direction. He says, but nevertheless, it is true there's something to Bickerman's thesis, that the Jews representatives to the Seleucid monarchy gave it the impression that it would not be difficult to stamp out Judaism. But basically, Bickerman said, Antiochus wanted to do it. Hellenistic Jews would not have pushed him into doing it, but they might have given him the impression that it was going to be easy to do it. And I'm now going to follow in succession each of these three parts of, Bicker, of Heinemann's argument. First, Antiochus wanted to unify his kingdom. The main historical source on which Heinemann relies here is in the very beginning of the decrees, when Antio in the first chapter of 1 Maccabees, which is the main historical source for the period, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs. So Heinemann says, that's a very clear source. You've got to have something very good before you substitute somebody else as the author of these decrees. And Heinemann writes in my translation that he, Antiochus, based his edict upon the notion of imperial unity is very likely. For the Seleucids, as opposed to the Ptolemies, strove, if not precisely for a Gleichschaltung, nevertheless, for the assimilation of the different cultures of the empire. What Heinemann writes <clears throat> is that it's really very probable that, Heinemann, that Antiochus wanted to impose unity, imperial unity in Germany is Reichseinheit. It really is very probable that he wanted to impose such unity because the Seleucids did strive for the assimilation of the different cultures of the empire. In the middle of that sentence, he says, well, when they strove, it was not precisely for a Gleichschaltung. And now let's talk about that word. Gleichschaltung literally means bringing into line, unification. It's a word which originally comes from the work of electricians because the shelter is an electrical switch and if you have a Gleichschaltung, you can turn all the switches on and off at the same time. You've got one major cutoff, which you turn it on and you flip all the switches at once. It comes into use in another sense in the 1930s, in a metaphorical sense. Here's an extract from Victor Klemper's book on the language of the Third Reich. It's a book about what happened to the German language in the Nazi period. And it was written by a <clears throat> Jewish philologist who was married to a non-Jew and he was able to survive the war and um, he kept himself occupied by collecting evidence of what's happening to the German language in the 1930s and 40s. And he writes, the explicit mechanization of the individual himself was left up to the LTI. LTI is his Latin term for language of the Third Reich. It's most characteristic and most pro and probably most, excuse me, its most characteristic and probably also earliest creation in this field is Gleichschaltung, to force into line. Teachers in various institutions, various groups of employees and judiciary and tax authorities, members of the Stahlheim and the SA, and so on, are brought into line almost ad infinitum. The word is horrendously representative of the basic attitude of Nazism that everybody can be manipulated and should be manipulated together in the service of the state. 
For example, here you have a law, one of the first laws after Hitler came to power already in the spring of 1933. You have the Vorläufiges Gesetz zur Gleichschaltung der Länder. This is the temporary law for the Gleichschaltung of the various states of Germany and to bring them in line mit dem Reich. This is what Gleichschaltung was about. All of the different states, Bavaria, Saxony, they all have Prussia, they all have to fall into line. Just like unions all have to fall into line, the press has to fall into line, the judiciary has to fall into line. And here you have Heinemann. When he's thinking about what the Seleucid kingdom is up to, saying they are striving for unity. Well, it's not exactly Gleichschaltung, but that's the way scholars write, yes? When he writes, it's not exactly Gleichschaltung, he's making sure we don't accuse him of being too contemporary in his writing, but that's what he's thinking of. Heinemann is looking around and he's saying, oh, I am very familiar with the notion of a state that is trying to impose unity on everybody. Here's a election poster from those days in Germany. Ein Volk, ein Führer, ein Ja. One people, one ruler, one yes at the voting polls. I'm very, Heinemann was very familiar with a state which was doing something like that. It was easy for him to accept at face value what First Maccabee says about the motivation of Antiochus Epiphanes. That's my conclusion about the first part. Second point, Heinemann insisted in the negative part of his argument <clears throat> that even Hellenistic Jews would not coerce other Jews to violate laws of the Jewish religion. Here, for example, he says, insofar as the historical record completely reports what happened, it distinguishes unambiguously between Jason's cultural political measures in the 170s which sharply opposed Jewish popular customs, those are those folk sitta, but opposed Jewish religious law, the Legion's Gazettes, only to a limited degree. We have to distinguish between those things which were being done by Jason on the one hand, and on the other hand, Antiochus's decrees, which deliberately sought to abolish the Jewish religion. So he's saying, yes, it's true. When Jason did what he did in the 170s, he <clears throat> was opposed to Jewish popular customs. He was trying to get Jewish youth to play games that the Greeks play. Jews were not used to playing them, but that's not a matter of Jewish law. He was trying to get the Jews to wear Greek clothing as opposed to their traditional clothing, but that's not a matter of law. These are just popular zitte, popular customs. It was only Antiochus who deliberately sought to abolish the Jewish religion. And when you read that, you realize that for Heinemann, the Jewish religion and Jewish law are equivalent. They are synonymous. Jewish religion is Jewish law. And therefore, as long as Jason wasn't touching Jewish law, he wasn't touching Jewish religion. So Heinemann is saying there's a big gap between the 170s and the 160s, different people doing things and the one, the Jewish ones were not touching the heart of Jewish religion, which is law. They were just touching marginal ancillary things. And we should not allow Bickerman to confuse us about that. Now, if you look at a text like that and you say, where does he get his distinction between Jewish law and Jewish practices? Well, Look here as an example of it. Heinemann says, even the introduction of a gymnasium is not, as Bickerman thought, prohibited by Jewish law. Heinemann insists, a prohibition of a gymnasium is nowhere to be found in Jewish writings. In other words, Heinemann's measure of what is Jewish religion is Jewish law is written in Jewish writings. And if you can't point to chapter and verse in Jewish writings, which say that a gymnasium is forbidden, then even the establishment of a gymnasium, which probably ruffled people, probably made people a little unhappy because the, their kids are going there instead of going to something more Jewish and more traditional. Nevertheless, it's not forbidden by Jewish law. And to get to the point now, I will say what this reminds me of is Hirschian orthodoxy. And I have here, for example, a passage 
from <clears throat> a polemic writing written in the context of the uh, struggles of Hirsch's community in Frankfurt uh, in 1876, where the writer says, it's an anonymous pamphlet. We want to do nothing in contradiction to the provisions of the Shulchan Aruch, but we do not want everything we do to derive from it. What the whole notion of Torah in Derech Eretz is about is you can do Torah and you can also be involved in Derech Eretz, the way of this world. You can have a job, you can study other things because Torah being Jewish doesn't take up your entire life. It is defined by Jewish law and leaves you space around that for other things, space which would not be there if you were also insisting on observing everything which has traditionally been done by Jews. And Heinemann was very closely associated with the Orthodox Hirsch community in Frankfurt. When I gave you, when I showed you that snippet of his, uh, the entry on him in an encyclopedia, you see he's from Frankfurt. His father was an Orthodox scholar in Frankfurt. Heinemann's grandfather and his hero, as we'll see in a minute, was Hirsch's collaborator in founding the Orthodox school in Frankfurt. Heinemann's father, Heinrich Heinemann, had taught in the Samson Raphael Hirsch Schule, which is what it was called after Hirsch died. Urbach was a professor here in Jerusalem and knew Heinemann well. He was also in Breslau in the good old days. In writing a eulogy for Heinemann, he writes, it was in this atmosphere of neo-orthodoxy, which had Torah Derech Eretz as its banner, that the young Heinemann was educated. That's how he was brought up. And among Heinemann's later publications, we find, for example, an article in memory of his grandfather on the grandfather's 100th anniversary. And when you read this, this is hagiography, it's the lives of a saint. He is so enthusiastic about his grandfather who was Hirsch's partner in setting up orthodoxy in Frankfurt. He writes a couple articles on the history of the secession from the Frankfurt Jewish community under Hirsch. Hirsch, the formative years of the leader of modern orthodoxy. This guy is living Hirschian orthodoxy. When his father died in 1898, it was front page news in Der Israelit, which was the journal, the central organ für das Orthodoxe Lentum, the central organ of Orthodox Judaism in Germany. The death of Heinemann's father was front page news in this newspaper, and it goes on for four pages. So I'm saying this is his world. And What was he doing during all those years between his doctorate and getting a job finally in Breslau? He was working in the family business because his father eventually set up a boarding school for girls, Jewish girls in Frankfurt. You see it's called the Dr. Heinemann's Pensionat School and it's a, a school and what kind of education they give. They give thorough scientific, domestic and social education. Grundlich as Germans, everything is good. They're engaged in making Jewish girls well at home, both in science and also in running households and getting along in society. This is an ad for the school in 1904. Heinemann was teaching in this place for all those years. Whoever wrote the article in that encyclopedia, either didn't know it or didn't think it was important enough to mention, he is working in a gymnasium. And here's an ad for the same place <clears throat> from 1917. It's all of those years, it's still existing. And they're offering advanced course in science, domestic and social education. And it's the kind of place which is said in another article in Der Israeli to be a flourishing institution to which so many young girls Oh, their piety. The Heinemann has a doctorate in Greek philosophy, gained at the same time he's studying in a rabbinical seminary for Orthodox Jews. And he's engaged in educating young girls to be both perfect, perfect, get all the basics in science and in running a house and in being pious. Heinemann simply had to oppose Bickerman's thesis 
that Jewish Hellenists as such were opposed to Jewish law and even willing to seek to force other Jews too to give it up. Heinemann was an Orthodox Jew whose whole career was devoted to studying Hellenism and especially Jewish Hellenism and who worked for decades in the family's gymnasium. That could be maintained only by distinguishing between an obligatory core of Jewish law and other folk practices that could be abandoned, thus allowing space for life in the non-Jewish world. Like the guy I quoted before, we want to do everything the Shulchan Aruch says, but we don't want everything we need to do to be governed by it. Torah in Derech Eretz required Heinemann to think that it can't be the Hellenizing, Hellenizers among the Jews who were the villains of the story because he is a Hellenizer among the Jews. And he's engaged in training others just like that. Bickerman, who came from Eastern Europe, didn't know from such things. He knew people who were totally Jewish or totally not Jewish. He chose to be basically totally not Jewish. But he didn't know about such methods of distinguishing between a core which was limited which would allow you to go on um, being Jewish and nevertheless have a whole lot of derech eretz alongside of Torah. Now I go to Heinemann's third point and it's the most painful of the points. Heinemann says at the end of his article, it is true that the Jews representatives to the Seleucid monarchy gave it the impression it would not be difficult to stamp out Judaism. Here you have my translation of the very last lines of the article. And bear in mind, it's an article being written in Breslau in 1938. Heinemann was one of the last people in the seminary by then. Most of them had already left and gone wherever they were able to go. At the end says, Heinemann, Heinemann says, it may well be asked if Antiochus Epiphanes himself would have introduced his measures had he been able to expect the passionate resistance of a significant part of the Jewish community. But if that is so, namely that he would not have done it had he expected passionate resistance, if that is so, then, however, the Jewish Hellenists do bear a certain degree of guilt for the religious persecution, although not in the way Bickerman believed. They did not, as Bickerman believed, initiate the complete eradication of Judaism, which Antiochus attempted to carry out if at all possible. And Heinemann even says the great majority of them hardly desired it. The great majority of Jewish Hellenists did not want to eradicate Judaism. But the king did not, however, need to fear any serious resistance on their part. And it was the misfortune of Judaism as far as Unglück des Judentums, these are very heavy words. And the last sentence of his article makes them all the heavier. It was the misfortune of Judaism, Heinemann writes, that Antiochus measured its, inter, its inner strength according to those Jews with whom he was in familiar. The Jews who were coming to him, they're making their diplomatic delegations to him. And he thought, oh, that's what Jews are like. Jews who connect, whose connection with the traditions of their Jewish community was by then only very loose. That's what Heinemann says. And you wonder what catalyzed that notion? What gave Heinemann that impression? Heinemann viewed the ancient Jews representatives vis-a-vis -vis the Seleucid government in light of his assessment of Jewish leadership in his own day vis-a-vis -vis the Nazi government. The head of the Reichsvertretung der Deutschen Juden, which was the national organization representing Jews to the government, from its foundation in 1933, was Rabbi Dr. Leo Beck, who was a leader of German liberal Judaism. Beck was a scholar of ancient Judaism who competed with Heinemann in their scholarly work. They both have footnotes about the other one. They complain about each other. They are competitors. And probably more importantly, Beck was the head of the liberal rabbinical seminary in Berlin that competed not only with the Orthodox seminary in Berlin, where, where Hildesheimer seminary, ceremony, seminary, where Heinemann had studied, but it also competed with the more conservative seminary at Breslau. 
And there were clashes between Heinemann and Beck about different issues. Some of them were scholarly, some of them had to do with Jewish politics, how to organize things. In the pressure cooker of 1938, with all German Jews trying to understand who was to blame for their troubles, that's the way people are. It was all too easy to blame the Jewish representatives. It was all too easy for Heinemann to think that if liberal Jews were representing the Jews in Jerusalem to the Seleucid king, then if, he, then if he had, as he did according to Heinemann, his own reasons and desires to try and stamp out Judaism, they would give, give, they would give him the impression that they would be pushovers. I will end this presentation with the last slide. <clears throat> Benedetto Croce wrote that all history is contemporary history. And that's true. Whatever historians write about any time in the past always tells us something about the historian's own present. But it's also the case that history can be history of the past. History is really, historians really do tell us about the past as well. But they do it in different ways according to their own present and their own context. Historians' constructions of what happened in the past are often inspired by their understandings of their respective present. So like Cherry Cobra, I said, was certainly inspired by the Israeli War of Independence to think that there had been such a thing in Judea in the second century BC as well. And that inspiration is necessary. First of all, it's gonna happen whether we want it or not because people do live in the real world and they get their ideas from their own context. And it's also fructified because it directs different historians' eyes in different contexts to different sources, and therefore it ensures that more evidence will be examined and from more points of view. It's always the case that there's more evidence out there than the evidence that a particular historian wants to build his cases on. And the fact that there are plurality of historians in different contexts ensures that all the evidence will be reviewed. But the route from inspiration to proof, from hypothesis to thesis, must be followed by dis with discipline with responsible attention to the ancient sources and a good measure of self-awareness and self-criticism. And as for the issue at hand, I would say that life is complex and different explanations are not, not necessarily mutually exclusive. And I tend to believe that both national aspirations, like Cherry Cover said, and the cultural clash played their roles in touching off the rebellion. But today I wasn't talking about establishing that, I was talking about understanding where Heinemann came from, and I hope I suggested that properly. And I say thank you very much. And if now if there are questions, there's some time for that. Let me, should I stop sharing the screen so I can see everybody? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Thank you, we're very uh, illuminating, you know, sheer, uh, it's a good word to use on Hanukkah, I think. But anyways, okay. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, I had heard of Heinemann through, through Nechama Leibowitz. That was my exposure to Heinemann, but I didn't know, and I knew of Darche Agada, I knew that work of his, but uh, all the historical stuff, anyways, very interesting. I don't wanna, um, you wanna go through the, the chat box? You want me to read it oh. for you? Oh, hello, Marty. There's not that much in it. Um, I'll go and see what there is. I guess Gershon's question, which took me a while to figure out, I think I think what he's asking, just to make it a little easier, can the rule of minhag is kedin, that we treat a, a custom as strictly as a law, be attributed to the desire to oppose the sort of change that Hellenizer condoned? In other words, uh, how much of, you know, uh, what I the fact I'm so fair, perhaps, you know, at making minhag very important, how much of that, well, I guess it is related to reform. Right, yeah, it's, I think it's, um, it's a reaction, yeah? yeah. When somebody pulls in one direction, somebody's going to pull in the other direction, and that goes for the Khatam Sofer as well. And uh, uh, we tend to, when somebody's attacking something, we tend to defend a whole lot more. That's the way people are. Okay. What was not Jewish curriculum for girls? I have not yet been able to find any documents on the curriculum of the school. I've, I've driven the the state, the city archives of Frankfurt crazy, trying to find what was being reported to it because schools had to have their licenses. I was not able yet to find any material documenting what they were studying. 
uh, and I have not found any, it's, it's too late probably in history to find graduates of the school. I've tried that as well. And maybe I went across somebody's memoirs or diary, but so far I, I've made a lot of efforts and unsuccessful to get anything beyond those bare words in the advertisement about Heusliche and Gesellschaftliche um, and Wissenschaftliche Erziehung. Um, so what do you think the cause? Well, I said, where can I access your overheads? What are overheads? I, I assume you mean the slides. You'll, you'll send them, so we'll, they'll get posted on our website in the next little okay. while. All right. Um, yeah. Um, I also, I agree, history is fascinating. And um, very frequently, um, I find myself I'm an historian, I'm a, and I find myself not only reading other historians and thinking about ancient history, which they're writing about, but I'm thinking, why did he write that and I wouldn't have written that? Why did she write that and I would have written it differently? And you start thinking thoughts like these about the context in which people live and work. Of course, that raises the whole question. I mean, of course, everybody brings their personal experience to their understanding of history, but it it it's you know, how much of history is by, you know, history is written by, by, by the winners. It sort of raises that whole issue. That's, I don't know how to solve that issue. Yeah, I don't right. know if anybody does. The, the only thing I could say is that um, we have to be aware of the issue and we do our work by publishing it and submitting it to the criticism of our colleagues. So if you have a good idea because of something in your context, you still, that's only the beginning. That's what I wrote about hypothesis and thesis. Then you have to see if you can establish it or not. So you got a good idea and it can be tested against the, th the, um, uh, the sources. And if it doesn't work and you think it does work, your colleagues will be very happy to point out to you that you're wrong. Uh, that's the way we try and- Peer so, review, good old yeah, peer review. Exactly, that's right. That's the best we can do. Yes. Okay, any questions? Anybody wanna unmute themselves and uh, ask orally a question, Bakashav, really again, um, thank you very much for, um, that talk and really I think a field and uh, very few people knew about it. I'm glad we, you know, we had talks on the Maccabees, the book Maccabees directly. It's always nice to bring it into much more of a um, modern modern context and uh, Yashikoch, thank you. Okay, um, this this evening, I, it's, 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 it's my turn, I guess, the rotating Parsha Shir, Parsha in case this evening, talk a little bit about Hanukkah, but mainly on the Parsha. Everybody's welcome. That's at 8.30 this evening. I, like I mentioned, it'll be on the, it'll be on, not on the Hanukkah log, on the regular log, and I'll send out the um, link a little bit later. It's the one you've been using, you know, until this week. And uh, I want to thank everybody and look forward to seeing you. And uh, next week, Rabbi Leifdag, we begin on Sunday morning with our back, our regular schedule back to uh, King Cyrus and, you know, Second Temple period and not in the Hanukkah context. He's actually talking about um, Asar Batebe. That's going to be his topic this week, and uh, we look forward to learning with everybody. And have a have a wonderful day, and uh, enjoy as we Ned. It's already the last day of Hanukkah in Israel. Here we're still in the middle of the seventh day. But uh, yes, uh, Mel wants to thank Marty Lecture We mentioned at the beginning for making the shidduch between, if we can use that word. Um, and thank you very much, everybody. Okay, we'll see you all soon. Thanks.